Why, hello, Internet! My name is Prunk, and today we are going to go over some Shimmering Skies deck or at least some theories of what can be worked and played next set. Now, I'm sure you've seen the yellow-purple aggro list, and I'm sure you've seen the Ruby Amethyst updates and the Steel Song stuff coming out and all the normal meta stuff that you're going to see, and everyone's going to be net decking day one. What I want you guys to do is have an open mind, and let's play some colors, or at least color combinations, that don't get to see too much love. I feel like this set, more than any other set, is really going to allow other color combinations to breathe in our metagame. And you will start seeing more color combinations this set, and them being good, than I believe any other set. Now, Forbidden Mountain, the, I d agree with the stance of this. In order for my deck to be considered, no matter what the deck is, this deck is probably the bar. Yellow, purple, this set is the benchmark. I 100% agree with this. I think that it's going to be one of the most common decks. It is a terrifying deck list. Every set, there is a benchmark of what you need to do with your deck building and make sure that you your deck is able to deal with problematic cards. So each of these three lists I'm going to show you have their own ways of dealing with those set like problems. And I'm really excited to kind of show these off. And again, these are just like different color combinations that you normally wouldn't see, but I'm really happy with how these decks have turned out. I think there are definitely ways to tweak and modify, and this is just version one, and they're performing pretty well. So let's take a look at them all, and uh, let's see what we can do. All right, starting off, we're going to go with a green-purple mid-range deck build. Uh, the nice thing about mid-range decks is they often control and beat out aggro. If you can survive the initial onslaught from an aggro list, you're usually going to have some nice benefits and often be able to win the game out. You just have to kind of survive that initial onslaught. However, and against other matches, if we're going to be place, facing against like more of a control board, which may not be as common this set, I think that we can, with tweaking our list to be a bit more aggressive, we can also have a good advantage on this. Midrange is probably one of my favorite deck types to play just because I like the versatility where I can deal aggro or I can be an aggro. So let's get into the card by card. We are playing four Cursed Merfolks. They are a problematic aggro card. If I want to outrace you, I'm going to try and outrace you. If not, then I got Pegasus. Pegasus is a great evasive target to get into our five drop Pegasus, which will allow me to sing songs and help control the board a little bit more if I need to. We're going to be playing on the two drops. Four copies of Flynn Rider. Uh, again, just more aggro list. Or if I do need to go into that control list, then I have morphs to help go in. I'm also playing four copies of Aurora, again, just to kind of play with that aggro list. She's got a good stat line. She's going to deal with a bunch of the 1-1s and make good trades if I need to. So it is a good option to play her. And her body, uh, big body Floodborne does shift on three as well. So I can play her in curve and start making favorable trades while giving my lower cost characters ward if I need to. We are playing Jacques. The important thing about Jacques is he's going to give somebody reckless. So if I do have that board out on the field... I'm going to have to make sure that I can slow down aggro players, making them, hopefully giving them to make some bad trades that they don't want to have to make. So if I need to have them trade, trade a Lilo into something else, if I need to have them trade a Pinocchio, Jacques is going to be there to really help set the tone and make them the aggressor while I can lure up a little bit more. If not Jacques, then I have Kit Cloud Kicker, setting them back a turn. We're going to be playing four copies of Kit. I think Kit is going to see a huge influx of play this set. Uh, just setting an aggro player back a full turn is huge. He's got a decent stat line to help us make some trades after the next turn. But the fact that he comes into play and is going to bounce a problem card, it we need so we do, we're going to need him. As far as our Floodborne lineup, this is kind of what I went along with. This is Peg we got Pegasus four copies. He's going to be our evasive threat. He's going to still help us deal with Diablo because he's, I'm sure he's going to be out there lurking in the meta somewhere. And so this card is our best out to Diablo. But otherwise, it's going to have us sing some songs on turn three, so that way we can start controlling the board a little bit more. Aurora is a good alternative as well, as is Cogsworth. I could possibly decide to flip Aurora and Cogsworth personally. I'm kind of debating. Uh, the reason I have the Cogsworth is to shift into more, um, off a morph, and that way I can make some good trades if I need to. But I, I'm kind of not sure which one I'd want four and three copies of. Another good shifting card coming out on Shimmering Skies is King Candy. Now, this card is pretty nice because it's going to allow us to put some dead cards or dead actions back into our discard pile against aggro list, um, or just get us the right cards that we need. 
And then finally, we got a Kit Cloud Kicker. This guy is Aggro's Dream, especially if we can shift this onto our little morph and uh, play this on turn three. Just questing for f uh, four, three lore. Yeah, three lore. Got a good stat line. He's got ward. Um, if I need to start making trades with him, I can do so, and he can survive a couple hits. So Kit looking at four drop is pretty great. As far as actions, I'm playing two copies of Remember Who You Are. We are a bit of an aggro list, and so when we're playing aggro, we're pretty much emptying out our hands, so this card is pretty live most of the time, except if you're facing the purple-yellow. They're often going to be th dropping more characters on the field than you are right away. So this card can be dead, but it can be discarded by King... Or not even discarded. Put it on the bottom of your deck by King Candy if you need to. Otherwise, uh, this card is mostly live. You're welcome because we are shifting on turn two or three in most cases. Uh, I'm sorry, we're shifting on turn three in most cases. This song is always going to be live, so that way we can get rid of a problematic card that we can't quite deal with. Yes, it does allow them to draw two, but if that's the case, remember who you are is allowing us to draw back those cards. So it's a good little one-two combo if we need to. Let it go as our pro get rid of this problem. This is there for Baloo. Uh, be if you can just put the Baloo back into the deck, that just means they wasted their turn three and it was just good value on, y on your case. Yeah, they get the ink, but they often go more than five ink anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And finally, what really sets this deck up for an aggro lineup is Medal of Heroes. So far against some of the AI bots, I was at like 10 lore with four characters in the field. They had game if I did, uh, they just quested it all out. And the next turn, I was able to just quest it all out with a Medal of Heroes to get me to like 10 lore in a single turn. This card is crazy, crazy good. And I think because of these tools, we will get to see. Uh, this list is really flexible in the sense of we have aggro and we have a bit of control and we have the mid-range control, like mid-range decks. All these Floodborne characters are all pretty strong on their own. They all can sing our songs uh, with the uh, You're Welcome and Let It Go, which are great control songs, and keep a strong body on the field as well. So this is a pretty fun list so far. I'm this is just version one of it so far, and I, I've been pretty happy. Uh, we're sitting at 34 Emerald cards, 26 Blue. Uh, we're only playing 10 Uninkables, which we could probably figure out some ways to bump that up if, a little bit more if we needed to. Uh, just because there are a lot of powerful uninkable cards that we might want to fit in. But so far, this list is feeling pretty strong, and I I'm pretty happy with it. Maybe shift like the one-drop Pegasus for Diablos and do something like that, but we're not playing too many actions, so I don't know if that's that worth. Uh, there's just a few tweaks that I think we can do. But I think the main centerpiece is really just morph into on turn two, and then whatever Floodborne you have on turn three is going to be a huge impact, and hopefully be able to sing you a song or take out some big like aggro threats on the board so blue green mid range i'm liking this list quite a bit so far it's a little bit more unique it's got aggro it's got some control like it's it's doing a little bit of everything and i think this can actually compete pretty well so far all right we got back to another green deck as well we are seeing green red here and with this i was really hyped on this on the end of set four i've really really enjoyed the deck list a lot and I think set five is going to allow us to really answer some problems. Um, give us a little bit of a unique deck that can be, again, aggressive. But there's a lot of really strong Floodborns as well. We have a pretty strong late game. We have an eh, okay early game. Um, but playing around with more really cool Floodborns, we have our answers to Diablo. We have our answers to the one drops as well and be an aggressive line. So let's go over the card by card for this one. Um, I am playing three copies of Small Diablo. It's just, I, I want to see this in my opening hand, and that's really about it. So like I did cut this one down to three just to kind of make room for some other stuff. Four copies of Pegasus again. Four copies of Marf. As you can see, it's probably becoming one of my favorite cards because it's so flexible. Um, and as the game progresses, this card's just getting better and better. Four copies of Queen of Hearts. We need to deal with aggro. That is 100% the biggest weakness of this deck is getting to that point. Three or four copies of Diablo Floodborn. We are playing three copies of the Uninkable Sisu, and this card right here is going to be very, very impactful this set. I feel like with the amount of aggro lists coming out, this is going to be your answer to the Daisy Duck in most red decks. I can see this list coming in. Now we start going, and we're going to the four copies of Pegasus as well, getting evasive characters, uh, giving all your other characters evasive. It's just a good card. And again, we just if we want to sing songs, this card's great for singing those songs. The interesting tech choice that I'm playing around with right now is Mr. Donald Duck. Um, if we shift this with on turn four with Morph, they are often, if you're playing against that aggro list, they are often above 10 more already, which is a huge problem. The uh, But 
this character is allowed so like if they're above 10 this guy gets huge um huge stats he becomes like a plus six so he's like a nine six um but when he is shifted in with a flood um morph your your opponent's gonna lose two lore and that little bit of loss has saved me in a couple AI games so far, just because I'm able to kind of manipulate it and just consistently take away two lore. But so far, it's been very mid. I'm sure there are some better options that we might want to play around with so far. But Donald Duck, I feel like this is probably going to be a cheap legendary on launch, so I'm going to stack up on him when I can. And just if and he's, I feel like he's going to be like a two dollar legendary after a certain point. So I'm going to get him and test it out, see how well he works out. But so far in testing, he's doing okay. Uh, Queen of Hearts, uh, four copies. It's your draw engine for the deck. And then Mother Gothel, this chick right here. This card is basically just Mother Tr uh, Lady Tremaine, but it bounces to your opponent's hand. But the nice thing is this card is inkable. So we are not stressing as much about uh, on inkables as my last list. I was always consistently like bibbity bobbity uh, Tr Lady Tremaine after the morph shift so I can like pop two characters. But if I can just put them in back in their hand, then that's kind of like dealing with them anyways. So I like this character, plus she doesn't die to Madame Medusa, which I still think is going to be a looming threat. Um, she's got a great stat line at a 4-6. The fact that she's inkable, I think this card does outscale Tremaine, even though it puts it back in their hand, which will be a problem against the Amethyst decks. I still think that this card in stat line, inkability, and flexibility is going to be better. Uh, we're playing two copies of Mulan. We really only want to use her if we're going to shift onto the morph. Uh, we're going to play three copies of Aladdin. I think it's time for him to come back. And again, it just comes down to on turn five, if I can surprise him, I'll play the morph on turn four, play Aladdin next turn, take out two more lore, take out an enemy character. This card, I think, can see a little bit more of a resurgence, possibly. It's a test. And if you ever, I liked this card a lot in set one, but obviously it's been pretty away from the meta. Nobody plays this card at all. And I think that it, it could see a comeback here because we need to start taking away some of those lore because those decks are just too fast. We're playing two copies of Sisu. I'm probably going to bump this up back to four. Um, I, I think we have room for like the uninkables sitting at 12 uninkables right now. So I think this card can definitely go to four and then possibly just take out the Mulans instead. It might be a very good option instead. Now being able to shift on turn six is awesome. And even not, this card is still live on eight. Uh, so I think that we I might switch, cut out Mulan and play Sisu instead, uh, just because it's only one turn difference, but I think Sisu just makes that much more of an impact. But other than that, we're playing four copies of Brawl, uh, just probably the best removal in the game right now. It's the, This card is less valuable in an aggro matchup, and what I mean by that is on your turn three, your opponent is probably still dropping multiple characters on the board. They prob If they played Baloo on turn three or then this card is fine because it's just kind of a one-for-one one trade and they didn't gain any progression. But hopefully your other characters on board would will have dealt some um, damage to your other opponent's characters. Otherwise, you're still set back a turn by playing Brawl. So just be aware that you're not your best turn on three may not always be Brawl. It may be having to go and shift into something and try and take out characters that way. Um, we are playing three copies of Bibbidi Bobbidi. This is the bread and butter of this deck, being able to bounce off whatever you shifted in with Morph. So sometimes you need the car a card draw, and we're going to go into Queen of Hearts. Sometimes you play Mother Gothel and just double bounce her again. Uh, there is a lot, and sometimes you play the Donald Duck and, uh, to help redeem the, get rid of the lore, but now you want to play Queen of Hearts instead. Uh, double bouncing the Sisu is insane. So like this card helps a lot for your tempo plays. I think it's very, very important. Good, good, good fit for this deck um, you're welcome just more tar it's more songs that you can sing and deal with removal options it's yes it's giving your opponent two cards but at the end of the day it's not that big it's not as big of an issue if you're dealing with a problematic threat and then you're gaining control of the board the tech choice that I made to help make sure I get a turn two kill on the daisy duck because you're going to see it a lot is potion of might uh, this card says banish this item chosen character gets plus three so if i decided to play a diablo or on turn one he's a one two and then on turn two i go down and play potion of might chosen character gets plus three this turn so turn two one to play one to banish this potion so basically two uh plus two uh, i'm sorry plus three makes him four attack he's able to trade with the daisy and stay on board so Potion of Might, I think, might start seeing and might see a bit of a research, uh, not research, it hasn't seen. I think this card is going to be really important for this metagame to be able to make favorable trades. Plus three attack for two is pretty decent, um, especially if you don't have another good turn to play. 
Uh, Medallion of Weights, I love this card. Um, just draws you so many cards. Uh, basically, it says draw four, uh, pay, pay two, and get to your character gains plus two attack. Again, we get need that attack boost, especially if we are sticking with Mulan's. But it then also gets to draw whenever they challenge a character. So that's this list here. Um, this is feeling pretty fun. It's definitely struggles probably a little bit more against aggro than I would like. Uh, it's leans more into mid range to like late game. Um, you do have a few cards to help control the early game so that way it doesn't escalate too far. But once you're able to start bouncing your floodborne characters, then it starts feeling really good. And finally, we have Blurple. Blurple is 100% the color combination that I have been working at for so long. This is a car, uh, color combination that I earned my Stitch for uh, during st uh, Rockstar Stitch during Set Championship. And I've always been a big believer that this deck was the phenomenal. It was just missing that key piece. And we are still kind of missing the big removal aspects to it, but we did get some with Cusco, uh, that blue Cusco. But ultimately it's still kind of missing that little bit of removal options that you need uh but i felt still think this deck is pretty competitive and this is probably what i'm going to be playing a majority of set five so archimedes makes his return back as your for uh your one uh, one drop two two goon um just great stat line and more importantly he has a shiftable target on turn three that is extremely meta relevant uh, Chernobog followers, if not, then he's still allowing you to draw cards and banish himself. Good feeds for the dragon, Great Stone Dragon. Uh, four, three copies of Metamim Snake. Um, I would like to play four somewhere into this list, but you're not. I don't have too many one drops that are able to bounce it, so I don't usually get to play this card on curve, anyways. So it's it, it's good. Snake is phenomenal. I gotta fit it, figure out how to fit a fourth one in somewhere. Um, and that might be big by cutting Tipo. Tipo um, is inking a card from your hand. He's basically Fishbone Quill. We are playing a decent amount of uninkables, so this card is often live quite a bit. This is better than Fishbone Quill, in my opinion, just because it is a bouncing effect, and it is getting a character on the field, so that way I can make better trades, allow myself to bounce on turn three with a uh, Madame Mim Fox. So this uh, Tipo, I think, is a really, really good option. Um, and honest, actually, I don't think I'd want to cut uh, one from here. I think you got to play four Tipos because just the inking into the next turn is so important. Uh, Madame M. Fox, best card in the game for uh, four copies. Uh, easy pick for her. Four, we're still playing four Goat. We're playing four Rabbits. We got enough bouncing, bouncing package. But the card I really want to talk about in the next set is this Uncommon Archimedes. This is a Shift 3 Evasive Quest for 2 when I don't need it to attack things. But when I do need it to attack things, it is a Challenger plus 3. So it does deal with Diablo. It deals with Daisy. It deals with a bunch of the early characters. I'm able to make very favorable traits and keep this character alive. Um, and this thing quests for two when I don't need it to take out anything anymore. It is a five cost, so it can sing Let It Go. It can sing any song that I might want to fiddle into the deck later on if I, if I decide, oh, yeah, the game's not, we're not as aggro heavy as I thought. And we can do like a Let It Go. Like this card is just great. Um, this is, this isn't my spotlight card for purple. I think Archimedes combo is very, very important for this set. Uh, we're only playing two copies of Cusco. It's our ink killer. It's our um, uh, Queen's Castle killer. I think it's a good card overall. It's not important to play as a four of, but giving your characters resist, I have not actually look, used that ability whatsoever yet. So I think that's pretty irrelevant. The big effect of this is just being able to ban banish a, or not banish a location, put a location into your opponent's ink well instead. Uh, I It just helps me deal with Queen's Castle because I do not have good answers for that. Um, Merlin. We're only playing two copies of the new Merlin, which people are probably going to be like, well, what? why? Um, he is Searching Bolt. Yes, but the deck doesn't need him. Often I play this character to shift onto the Merlin Goat and Rabbit, and sometimes I feel bad about doing so because I'm not crazy. I'm not too crazy about it uh, because sometimes I just want the extra draw instead or have a consistent bouncer to draw. But his stat line is pretty relevant being a 3-7. just, again, allows me to make favorable trades when I need to and keep him on the board. And if I need to bounce them, I at least get the rabbit and go back into my hand along with him later on. So he is really good. I opted into this um, going into Elsa, like this set, instead of the Anna. Anna. So the new Anna exerts all characters for until the start of your next, or I'm sorry, um, for that turn, your opponent readies them on the next turn. Whereas Elsa does allow me to have the control of just keeping them permanently exerted, which helps a lot against aggro. Typically, if I'm playing this card uh, on turn eight or seven, like I am 
this is usually the only card I have on play. So if I don't have any other characters right now at, at that point, and I played Anna, then the exerting doesn't matter. And since we don't have to worry about too many ward threats right now, I, I feel like Elsa is actively better. She quests for one more. She does cost one more, but I've never really... I don't hate Elsa right now. I think she is really, really strong and helps us keep that control. Uh, we're playing three copies of Mufasa. Again, it's just a card. Yeah, it's a great card. You don't need four copies of this. Uh, I think four copies is definitely overkill. A lot of times, two of, uh, two of them go into my inkwell, and then I'll get one of them back. <laughs> so uh, I think this card is insanely good. It is probably the fetch card of this set, in my opinion. I think a lot of people are going to be trying to hunt this down and play it. But I do feel like it'll probably fall off in the meta. It's not a necessary card. However, when this card goes off, it goes off off being able to restart your turn with a full uh, like set of ink after questing for four and then lucky diming and doing a bunch of other stuff love this card um this card's gonna be insane now hypnotic strength i'm gonna get shit about this but i this is a necessary evil card um this card, the card says draw a card chosen character gets challenger plus two this turn that is it it is a two drop cantrip and that is it uh, so the reason I'm playing this is, again, Daisy Duck is going to be a huge threat. I actually don't get much of a benefit off Daisy Duck because I'm playing a decent amount of actions and songs and items. So I want to kill Daisy anyways because I'm not getting any characters, I'd say, like half of the time. Where am I? That's 10, 22. So a third of the time, I am not getting any characters from Daisy. So... I want to pop it immediately. So in my turn one, if I do not have a, a Meta Mim Fox in hand, but I have Archimedes or Chernobog followers, I will have the Chernobog make the trade on turn two, uh, two after they've quested with the Daisy Doug because it I need to slow down the aggro. This deck, again, is going to struggle a little bit. So you really need, if you are facing that yellow-purple aggro list, you need to focus on mulliganing for your Fox and searching for your outs in your mulligan. Just always assume your opponent is playing aggro if you have no idea, because I do feel like, again, that is going to be the benchmark this set. So just assume they're playing aggro and mulligan for that accordingly, if you have no idea at least. So this card right here, Hypnotic Strength, I wish there were better options, but as of right now, I do not feel like there are, and this is the best option I have for turn two plays. Um, when they're not playing aggro, at least. If they're not playing aggro, then I'm going for Tipo. Um, otherwise, songs, four friends on the other side. It's draw two. Hard to not hard to pass that up. I didn't opt in to go for the draw three for five. Uh, this card's just inkable. It's a song. It's, I think, overall better. Uh, we're playing three copies of Let It Go because we do need some removal in our deck. We are playing four copies of Popsicle, two copies of Metal of Heroes. This card is, I, I really do feel like this card is insane. If Goat, this is basically you're playing Goat, but you're questing with something that's already on the board. So if you're getting your two lore out of the, uh, of this item, which if you notice, I actually didn't splash in Hiram in this deck for a four drop either, which might be a little weird. But so far, I have not been missing Hiram at all with this list, which I thought I would. I thought I was crazy for taking him out, but it, it's, the list feels good without Hiram. We don't have to focus on the um, the draw. We draw plenty. And finally, we got Great Stone Dragon. Uh, this card's ramping major ramping tool. I love playing this card, especially with the Mufasa stuff. Being able to get my good characters back from the discard pile and then get them back to my hand, hopefully, randomly, with Mufasa is phenomenal. Uh, you don't really, with the Tipu, you don't need the Fishbone Quill anymore, but this card is often very live because you are playing a lower drop characters with the Chernobog followers, we're playing Snakes, we're playing the Tipu, we're making trades, so this card is usually pretty live um, at, on curve. Um, Lucky Dime, playing two copies of, I mean, Mufasa is a four quester right here, Elsa is a three quester right here, and if you do combo that with like a Medal of Heroes, then that means you can Lucky Dime on Mufasa for six, um, so that's pretty insane. I opted, again, into not playing Tamatoa, which hurts my soul as a Ruby Sapphire player, um, or just playing as a, as a major Sapphire enthusiast. It hurts my soul not playing Hiram and Tamatoa, but so far, I feel like this list has been the most consistent version. I've gone through at least six different iterations. This is version five. Um, it says version one, but this is like five or six. And so far, I'm pretty happy with this list. This is the most tested list of my three lists right now.
So those are three unique deck lists that you can probably start playing, testing, and if you don't want to have to jump on the instant meta bandwagon, I do feel like they all have a pretty good competitive edge. They all have strengths and weaknesses, specifically aggro, um, but they have their early game answers. The decks are built with Daisy Duck in mind and with Diablo in mind, so you have those outs right away built into the lists. So... I do feel like each of them are going to need more tweaking, more adjustments, more playtesting. Um, but I do see them all as viable options this meta. Maybe not winning set championship, or I'm sorry, not set. Maybe not winning a Worlds or like a massive uh, 2,000 player tournament. But there is potential here at your locals. There's definitely potential to win these at a set champions. Um, I won. I won uh, last set with a Blurple deck myself. I do stand by behind that color. I honestly think that if I took a red green list from from last set to a set championship, I feel like I could have won one as well, or at least another Ursula may got top four. And I, I don't underestimate the power of some of these other com color combinations. They all have strengths and weaknesses. But if you want to see gameplay or anything else, please let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff. I'm probably going to try and do a little bit more Larkana stuff within the next coming months, just because this is my favorite card game right now. And I will have to catch you all next time. Peace out.